As Isaiah reminds us in chapter 53, verse 5, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. To receive his peace this Christmas, come to him and surrender, and through his act of faith, receive his grace of forgiveness and peace. And now let us pray. Father, forgive our sins. Forgive us our selfish, rebellious hearts. We open ourselves to you and invite you to come into us afresh and grant us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. All right. At, at this time, I'll invite you to greet each other and just spend a, you know, a few seconds doing that and then proceed out into the narthex for a uh, baptism service. You have a program for that, bring that with you. Thank you.
which is an outreach that we offer for the community and people around to walk through and experience the sights and sounds of Bethlehem on the night Jesus was born. We think that's what it looked like. Um, 
We would need your help if you'd be willing to dress up and participate as characters or actors. There are some, some places where there are no lines. There are other characters that you could portray that have lines. And I'd like for you to sign up in the narthex to help us out. There are also some little sheets of little flyers that you can take. And if you go someplace or work in an office, if you can set this out where people might pick them up or at school, if there's a space that you can put them out and share them with your friends. The best invitation is a personal invitation. And if you would like to help set up the set, if you would see me after worship, we're going to be working on that on Monday and Tuesday evening prior to the walkthrough, which will be Wednesday, the 20th of December. Thank you. Children, third grade and under are now dismissed for Children's Church. If you are here in person, if you take just a moment, there's a tear out in the back of your bulletin, the connect card. You can fill out that information and leave it in your seat and the usher will get it at the end of service. Uh, a few updates. Uh, thanks to everyone who's been taking the baskets and filling it with food for our ministry event that's coming up on this Saturday, December 16th. There are still a few baskets back there, so if you want to grab one of those and fill it and bless a family, it'd be much appreciated. It'd be a blessing to them and you. Also, coats and toys have been coming in all week. So there's still time to bring in uh, food, coats, toys, all that stuff. But we ask that you please have it to the church by this Thursday. Because that brings us up to next Saturday, which will be a great opportunity to uh, minister and be part of a group. If you'd like to help, we're having the God's table the food. Somebody to make the food and serve it. We're giving away coats, the food boxes. Uh, there'll be somebody, people, we need people to wrap presents. I'll carry all the items to the car. If you'd like to do that, arrive this Saturday at 8 a.m. Uh, we'll get organized. We'll pray for the community. Uh, then we'll have a great time serving, and it'll be a great bunch of people. I encourage all of you that can come to please do so. Um, Christmas Eve candlelight services. That's two weeks from today. It's coming up on us. Now, it's in the bulletin. I believe there's one at 7 and one at 11. So plan on attending that if, if you're able. Also, special thing today, Wanda Collier made ornaments. She does this every year, and she makes that as a blessing to everybody, but it's a blessing to her also to give them away and see people enjoy them. So, so please, everyone, grab an ornament on your way out to Wanda May and give Wanda a smile and a thank you, and we'll all have a blessed Christmas. And that's all I have. Have a blessed day. Uh, before I lead us in prayer, I want to share a couple of updates to uh, regarding the lives of some folks we've been praying for. We've been uh, praying for John Ryan Steger, the son of John and Phyllis Steger, for some time. He was diagnosed uh, some time ago with a stage four cancer, a very rare kind of cancer. The only treatment available is some kind of experimental treatment, and it's, it has helped quite a bit. Um, however, he had to have surgery on his spine a week or so ago. To remove a tumor that was causing a lot of pain and uh, that went well the surgery went very well and uh, so we thank god for that his family is so appreciative for uh, for our prayers and uh, ask that you would continue to pray for him but praise god for that good news there um, also um, haley dozier gave me an update on isaac hawker who is a 16 year old young man who is hospitalized in an induced coma with fluid on the brain. They don't know the source of it. He's, it's been induced in a coma for over a week. And so um, really no, no change in, at this point. And the family appreciates our continued prayers. All right, would you bow together in prayer with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're uh, in awe at who you are and what you do. God, you are able to speak to the hearts of anyone who will open their ears and listen. We've seen witness of that today, with a seven-year-old girl who has been hearing you speak to her heart, and she said yes to Jesus. There are many adults and other people here who experienced that years ago. 
and you've changed the course, you've changed the course of lives as we surrender to uh, you know, our lives to Jesus Christ, your son. Lord, you put us on a path to life that we never could have imagined because of you. And we praise you for who you are, how good you are to us, your mercy and love that you offer to us through Jesus, your son. God, we pray you'd be pleased through, uh, you know, just our worship today, the attitude of our heart and minds as we come here, you know, to please you, to honor you. Father, we do want to pray for several needs. We think of, first of all, the family of Missy Bolander, who passed away this week. We especially think of her husband, Jay, her children, uh, her niece, Katie Bailey, whom she raised as well and many other family and friends, Lord, who are grieving and sorrowful. Lord, would you come near to them? Uh, Lord, would you give them a sense of comfort and peace as they look to you? Father, we also want to pray for a couple people who have been dealing with heart issues. Think of Susan Davidson and Betty Dillo, who've been receiving treatment for heart issues and more treatment to come. God, would you continue to undertake for them? We pray for a couple of folks who are dealing with cancer. We think of John Ryan Steger and then also Jared Coronet who will be starting cancer treatment next week. Lord, will you uh, uh, just bring healing to them and care for their health needs as well? Lord, for all these persons that we pray for, will you most of all draw them closer to Jesus Christ through uh, the difficulties, may you bring good out of it. We also pray for Gerald Freeman, who's recovering from surgery, Larry Tomlin, Jim Frazier, Jim's son-in-law, Jason, who are all recovering from some pretty significant skin cancer surgery. And uh, Lord, we, we pray for your healing and, and grace in their lives. We also pray for, for Isaac Cocker, who's continues to be in this induced coma with uh, you know, fluid on the brain and an unknown source. Lord, we pray that you would be the, the, the great physician for him and raise him up to life. We also continue to pray for Juniper Joe Ware, a premature baby who was, was born Jim Luckadoo's great granddaughter and, and now has uh, you know, been doing well, but has now struggling with infection in her lungs and pneumonia and is at a critical time. God, thank you for the glimmer of improvement that they are seeing, and we attribute that to you. And God, will you continue to, uh, you know, just work through the power of your healing touch in that little one's life. Uh, and, and now, Lord, we just pray for our, our time of worship and Tracy Gibson bringing us the uh, your, your word to us. Father, uh, will you help us to be able to hear and will you bless her with uh, you know, the words to speak, to honor your name and to glorify Jesus, your son. It's in his name we pray, amen. Good morning. I'm going to invite you, if you would, to stand as I read our scripture focus verse for our Christmas in the Carols sermon series. We'll find that in Isaiah 9, 6. For, unto, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonder, Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You may be seated. Today our message focus is peace. And as I see it, there are two types of peace that each and every one of us needs. We need peace around us, but we also need peace within us. And as you know, throughout Advent, we're looking into some popular Christmas carols and their relationship to telling the scriptural truth of the birth of Jesus. 
See, because Christmas carols are more than just a tradition. They tell the story of God's plan to rescue us from sin. A plan that started with a teeny baby whose future was the cross. They're more than just a song we sing. They bear an important message for the whole world. The first Christmas carol made its appearance about 129 years after Jesus was resurrected. The year was A.D. 129, and in that year, the Bishop of Rome decreed the following. He said, in the holy night of the nativity of our Lord and Savior, all shall solemnly sing the angel's hymn. And the lyrics are from Luke 2.14, and they say, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So the practice of singing Christmas carols was birthed just 30 years after the death of John the Apostle. So that's a long living tradition. Would you agree with me? And today we're going to be looking at the carol, Do You Hear What I Hear, that we sang earlier. And believe it or not, this carol is not based on some ancient tradition of the church. Many people assume the song has been around for a long time. Many think it originated in Europe. But this song actually is much more recent than you would even imagine. It was penned in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis as a powerful plea for peace from a man who had experienced the horrors of war. The writer, Noel Regne, had experienced firsthand the atrocities of war. When Hitler's forces overran France, he was drafted into the German army against his will. He hated the Nazi regime that had invaded his country, but he was forced to wear their uniform nonetheless. Behind the scenes, he secretly worked with the French resistance movement, and he would relay information from the Germans and sneak it to the French. He was shot in the leg during an ambush of the German troops, and it's suspected that he was intentionally wounded by the French in order to protect him from the Germans in the belief that his injury would show that he was not working for the French. Not long after this encounter, Regne deserted the German army and lived underground with the French for the rest of the war. Only then did I feel free, he once observed. So fast forward two decades, and Noel found himself now living in America gripped by the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if you don't know the history of that, Russia had placed nuclear missiles within the Cuban borders, aimed directly at the United States. And if you didn't already know this, Cuba is just 90 miles away from America. Here's a picture of my family standing at the southernmost point of the United States. You'll find this in Key West, Florida. And if you can read at the top part of the black ring of that marker at the top, can you see what it says? That's right. At that point where we're standing is 90 miles to Cuba, just a short boat trip away. So Noel found himself gripped with fear at the thought of being entangled in another impending war as two nuclear superpowers stood eye to eye. So when he was asked to re by a record producer to write a Christmas song, he just didn't think he had it in him. He felt that Christmas had become so commercialized, and with the threat of war coming, who could think about Christmas? It was supposed to be a time of peace and goodwill. What had we turned it into? And after his meeting with that record producer, Noel describes what happened that evening with these words. En route to my home, I saw two mothers with their babies in strollers, 
The little angels were just looking at each other and smiling. All of a sudden, my mood was extraordinary. A glimpse of these babies filled Noel Regney's heart with poetry. The little ones also reminded him of newborn lambs. Thus the song begins, said the night wind to the little lamb. Do you hear what I hear carried a beautiful message to people in all walks of life. It became a popular Christmas carol, a song high above the tree, and it had a voice as big as the sea. But his message of peace was lost on many people. He said, I'm amazed that people can think they knew the song and not know that it's a prayer for peace. Noel Redney once told an interviewer, but we're so bombarded by sounds and our attention spans are so short. Let us hope and pray that when it's sung in churches worldwide during the Christmas season, that this song of peace will remind us that the child, the child sleeping in the night, he came to bring us goodness and light. And this song's message of peace is as desperately needed today as it was 61 years ago. Noel wrote lyrics to make us consider peace that we need all around us. Here are the lyrics of a popular carol like we just sang, Do You Hear What I Hear? Do you hear what I hear, said the night wind to the little lamb? Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little lamb. Do you see what I see? A star, a star, dancing in the night, with a tail as big as a kite, said the little lamb to the shepherd boy, do you hear what I hear? Ringing through the sky, shepherd boy, do you hear what I hear? A song, a song, high above the trees, with a voice as big as the sea, said the shepherd to the mighty king, do you know what I know? In your palace, more mighty king, do you know what I know? A child, a child, shivers in the cold. Let us bring him silver and gold, said the king to the people everywhere. Listen to what I say. Pray for peace, people everywhere. Listen to what I say. The child, the child sleeping in the night, he will bring us goodness and light. With possible war on the horizon, Noel Regne was concerned about the peace all around us. And in that concern, he pointed to Jesus, the child sleeping in the night as our solution. Now let's look at what it means to have peace within us. Talking about peace, how do we find unexpected peace in the middle of a classic Christmas meltdown? Peace sometimes seems to be this elusive thing during the Christmas season, ironically. We're all hoping at the end of the day, we can just get a moment of peace where all seems right with the world. The problem is there's all sorts of expectations that surround Christmas trying to relive our favorite past Christmas memories, trying to get the perfect gift, trying to find the Christmas spirit, whatever that is. And oh, our problems, they don't just go away. Actually, our life is more hectic than usual this time of year. How could we ever find peace in the midst of all of that? Especially when things don't go according to our plan. See, sometimes life just doesn't go according to plan, does it? Let me ask you this. What's interrupting your peace right now? What's threatening to cause a meltdown? Is it the stress of your job? Your finances? Certainly couldn't be one of your family members, could it? Did you know that having a lack of Christmas peace 
isn't just a modern problem that we experience. It goes all the way back to a man named Joseph. And today's scripture is Matthew 1, 18 through 25. And it reads, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This verse refers to the prophet of prophecy we find in Isaiah 7:14, which says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Typically, it's really easy for us just to read right past these verses to get to all the good stuff about Christmas. You know, the shepherds, the angels, the kings. But let's pause for just a moment and imagine what it must have been like to be Joseph. At this point, Joseph is probably no more than 18. It used to be thought that Joseph was much older, but recent scholars are now saying that they think Joseph was more like in his later teens. So think about what it would have been like to be young and full of life, excited for this future he was trying to build. He probably had big dreams about getting married, moving into a house together, starting his own business. And life was going just about as well as he had hoped. And then things went off track and veered from his plan. And Joseph must have been crushed. His fiance is pregnant and he knows he's not the father. Imagine the fight that must have ensued as Mary tried to explain it to Joseph, or anyone for that matter, how she got pregnant. No one was believing her. And so there he is, troubled Joseph. He's probably in full panic mode with no peace. How did he not see this coming? He's angry at Mary. He's depressed about his life, probably even despairing about his faith, his hopes, his dreams, his plans all crushed. This is probably the biggest storm that he's ever experienced to this point in his life. And we've all had those experiences where we're melting down. We feel like we're in an impossible situation where peace is nowhere to be found and all seems lost. But it's when things begin to go wrong, we find out where our peace actually comes from. See, often we look to our jobs or our finances or our health or our relationships to give us peace. But how bad would it shake you to find out that you're going to suddenly lose your job, your life savings, your house, or even your spouse? See, these are the things that rock our world. But we can find peace, even in the middle of difficult situations. Do you hear what I hear? God is calling each one of us to be reconciled to him. If you're not feeling very peaceful this Christmas, the first thing to do is make sure, without a doubt, that you're reconciled to God. The whole reason that Jesus came was to save us from our sins. That's what Christmas is all about. 
We have to come to terms with the fact that we're just not that great of people. And we need someone to save us. See, even Joseph needed Jesus to save him. And he was a good guy. But see, thinking that we're, quote, good people, that gives us a false sense of peace. First of all, how good is good enough? Deep down, that's a nagging question that can steal our peace. And at the end of the day, we have a sin problem that we need to be saved from. We don't like to think of ourselves that way, do we? Are we even comfortable admitting that we're not so great of a person? See, as good rural Americans, which we all are, we're polite and we're kind to other people. We let people go first at the stop sign. We let people cut in line in front of us at Kroger. We smile and we wave to our neighbors. Everyone knows everyone. We might even pay for someone's meal at a restaurant. Or we might donate food to the food drive. See, we do good things for others knowing that what goes around comes around. We're certainly not perfect, but we try to be good. And this is why for the good people all around us, it's hard for them to believe in Jesus because they don't think they need him. See, sometimes we feel like God owes us because we have good behavior. And then when something goes wrong, our peace is rocked because we feel like God has let us down. We might even think, why am I trying so hard to do what is right? Well, God isn't going to hold up his end of the bargain. See, that's not the gospel. We don't serve God because he will bless us. We serve him because he already has blessed us. And he doesn't owe us. See, the Bible says we've all sinned. We've all hurt people. We've all made a mess of our lives at some point or another. And we all need to be rescued. I mean, if we're honest, we're really ashamed of it. The horrible thoughts we've had, the mean things that we've said, the ungrateful, selfish ways we go about our lives, putting ourselves first, thinking only of ourselves. But see, that's the whole point of Christmas. When you see presents under the tree, remember God's gift to us that first Christmas was Emmanuel. It was God with us. He lives with us. He lives in us. He walks with us. And he is the only one that lived a truly good life. And then at the end of that life, he died a criminal's death to pay for all of our criminal activities. But see, all we have to do is accept it and then live in it. Living in his love and acceptance, that's what brings us peace. It's not our performance. It's nothing that we have done. Peace with God once and for all. Wow. Do you hear what I hear? He is calling for you. Do you see what I see? See those storms that are all around us, all around us in the world, <laughs> and in our very own hearts. It's God's way of bringing us closer to him. Can you see his movement in the events of your life? When we're going through these big storms and everything in our lives is going sideways, we really need to look to God. We need to look to him in the storm. Do you see what I see? See, for Joseph, an angel shows up. Wouldn't that be great if an angel would show up and just tell us what's going on? I don't know about you, but I've never had an angel show up tell me what to do next. Wouldn't that just alleviate so much stress? Instead, we feel like it's all up to us to figure it out. You know, logically. Our life is melting down all around us. 
and we're just supposed to figure it out? Well, good luck with that. But according to this passage, Joseph had made up his mind he was going to divorce Mary. I mean, that was the right thing to do, right? I'm sure that's what his parents and his friends told him to do. Logically, he was doing the right thing. But here's my question. Did Joseph pray about it? Is there even any reason to pray about this? So here's what I've learned from lots of years of accumulated wisdom and lessons that I've learned the hard way. God's ways are not our ways. The Bible says so in Isaiah 55, 8. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. Joseph saw this situation all wrong about what God wanted him to do. What seemed like devastation was actually God's divine plan. He just couldn't see it yet. And when we're in the storms of life, rest assured, God has a plan. God is up to something. God may be trying to get our attention, teach us something, or he may be altering the course of our lives for a very good reason. So we need to stop resisting the storms of life and look for God in the middle of them instead. What is he doing See, if God's ways are so much different than our ways, why are we so convinced that we know what God wants us to do? Unless we ask him. We need to look to God and listen. And how do we do this? There's so many things in our lives that prevent us from listening to God, and especially at Christmas time. Doesn't that seem ironic? When we're supposed to be focusing on him, our lives are too busy and too noisy to do that. Somehow when we quiet the noise around us and slow the hustle that we all get trapped in, we all do, we can see his will. When was the last time you slowed down enough to listen to God? Not ask him to listen to you but for you to listen to him. Have you taken the time to sit quietly with him? I'm not talking about getting to read the Bible in a year plan, but I mean to sit silently before him. To be still and to know that he is God. To breathe Oh, there's sometimes a foreign thought. Take a minute and think about that. Breathe. When was the last time you really took a nice, deep breath? Try it. Feels pretty good, doesn't it? Give yourself one more shot of oxygen. Just breathe. Relax. Think about how great he really is. To ask him to speak to you. And then give him the space to do so. Do you see what I see? He's right there waiting for you. Do you know what I know? Do you know that God calls us to live our lives for a specific purpose? One of the reasons we don't have peace is because we don't want to do what God says. You know, we're Americans. We're free to live our lives however we see fit. We think, I'm going to do what I want, and then I'll ask God to bless it. Or even, I'm going to go through that door, and if God wants to stop me, he will. Maybe he will send me an angel. Maybe we don't actually think it through that way, but it sure is how we often live our lives. Who is calling the shots in your life? Sometimes if we're honest, we already know what God wants us to do, but we're resisting it. We're like Jonah. After hearing from God about what we should do, 
He did something else. Maybe that's why God sent the storm to Jonah. See, because oftentimes it's not until we're in the middle of a bad storm that we finally turn to God and say, okay, God, I'm ready to know your plan now and forget about mine. What if God is asking you to do something that doesn't really make sense to you? I mean, think of Joseph. God's calling him to change his plan. God's calling him to give up the wedding. God's calling him to ruin his reputation. This is not how you have a good and comfortable life. Joseph now needs to figure out, where will we live? How am I going to provide for this new family? How am I going to deal with this criticism? It's coming from all around. And most importantly, how am I going to protect this most important child. Remember that God's ways are not our ways. Do you know what I know? I'm going to go back to the very first thing that angel said to Joseph. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid to do what God is asking you to do. Joseph was not to fear because the expected child was Emmanuel, God with us. And I'm sure that knowing that God was with them physically there gave them some peace. Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. That is the message that Noel Redney was writing about in his lyrics when he said the child, the child sleeping in the night, He's the one. He will bring us goodness and light. Do you know what I know? What I know? That it is only through that child, Jesus our Savior, the King of Kings, that we can ever know true peace. It's through him that we get real peace, everlasting peace. This Christmas, I pray that you can find that peace, real peace. If you've been trying to be good enough for God, as if he were like Santa and only awarded the good boys and girls, you have it all wrong. See, he loves you. He loves us, even in our messes. Accept his free gift and finally have peace with God. In the middle of our own Christmas stress, remember that God is with you and he is for you. We're going to take a moment to be still before the Lord. In that moment of stillness, if you would like to come and kneel before him in the quiet, you are definitely invited to do so. If you don't yet know his peace because you've not yet recognized him as your savior, he's waiting to show you that peace today. You can pray to him here at the altar or you can pray to him from your seat. But please don't neglect being still enough to listen to him. Do you hear what I hear? I'm gonna bow for a moment to listen and then we'll go to prayer. Lord, help us be still enough to listen to you.
Allow us, Lord, in this quiet to check our hearts. Enable us, Lord, to breathe in your spirit. To find you a peace and the quiet. Lord, our culture struggles with quiet. We struggle with inactivity. Allow us in this moment to rest in you. Help us, Lord, to surrender our storms and our stress to you today in exchange for the peace that only you offer. Draw us near to you, closer to your heart. Lord, to discern your ways and make us mindful of your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the peace that only you offer. And in humble surrender, Lord, we hand our lives to you to be used for your glory, Father. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen.
So the lack of peace because of family disputes, civil unrest all around us, war in at least two places on our globe, financial struggles, all these things sometimes make it hard to remember the peace that Christmas promises. The Christ child born to bring peace, the Prince of Peace, made his way to a cross so that you and I can know real peace. Peace deep down inside our hearts that brings a sense of joy regardless of the circumstances that surround us or threaten us even. It's only with that baby born in a manger whose life pointed toward heaven the whole time he lived a life that ended on the cross. <laughs> it's only through that that we can fully know and understand what peace really means. Take some time this week to breathe. Take some time this week to sit in a stillness and silence and remember to listen to him. This week, listen for his voice, look for his presence, and I hope you find peace. Have a great week.